one of the most acclaimed singers in the Indian music industry. His deep interest in science had made him consider being a research scholar initially and later on as a theatre artist. He wanted to join the Film and Television Institute of India, also known as the FDII. But then, music happened, and there hasn't been any looking back ever since. A self-taught musician with a velvet voice, Mr. Chauhan started his career with the Indian pop band Silk Root, which released two albums, Boonde and Pehjan. The song Duba Duba, that made waves during the 1990s, is remembered even today. He has many hit Bollywood songs to his credit. His songs in Rang De Basanti, Rockstar, Jab We Met, Delhi Six, Once Upon a Time in Mumbai, and in many more movies have left us spellbound to the magic of his voice. He is a two-time recipient of the Filmfare Award in the Best Male Playback Singer category. He has also been awarded the Z Cine Award thrice. Besides being a singer and a songwriter, the multi-talented Mr. Mohit Chahan also plays the harmonica, flute, guitar, and the saxophone. Sir, it is an honor and our absolute pleasure to have you amongst us today. Hi, Mohit. My name is Papa CJ. I'll be hosting you today. Yeah. Before we start, uh, is there anything you would like to say before we start? Well, I just want to say uh, the pleasure is mine coming here uh, to your beautiful school. And uh, this is my first time to this school. And, and uh, to many schools, actually. <laughs> uh, We've got head boys and head girls from over 37 different schools in right now over here. Yeah, in this audience. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Congratulations. <laughs> so, uh, head boys and head girls, you guys stay in that position for one year? Yeah. Okay. Two years. Two years. And then there's an election? Election, okay. So you guys start joining pretty early in life. Okay. Unless of course somebody like wants to join in the building. <laughs> okay, so uh, instead of any pre-planned questions, let's, should we just do this whole session as a Q&A? Okay. You're gonna wait, okay. This guy is the most N2 guy and if you don't answer his question, he will stalk you and come to your house. <laughs> so, uh, Stand up, tell us your name and ask your question to Moyal. On the mic please so everyone can hear. Good evening sir, I'm Rahul. So since you're in the creative line, how do you think creativity helps in shaping the mind of a leader? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, okay, like for example me, uh, I have never really trained in music in my life, okay. I started uh, school, college, I was born and brought up in Himachal Pradesh and uh, many, many places in Himachal Pradesh are really, really small towns and everybody knows everyone. You know, you walk down from your house, everybody, even the Sajiwala will say, hey, kaise hai, aap kab hai? everybody. So I was born and brought up and I grew up in Himachal and I was studying science, then I did my BSc, then I did my master's in science, in geology, but music was always, always part of me, you know, like creativity or I would love theater and listen to music, singing and everything. And being a creative person for the past, all my life now, hasn't really turned me into a leader, okay? But it helps you to understand what is going on around you at that point of time, you know, because music is like, like creativity for me is like meditation. You know, when I sing my songs, when I sing them at home, uh, it's like doing yoga, except it's not physical, but your mind learns to be patient. Uh, when you're an artist, you don't know when your next project is going to come. It teaches you a whole lot of patience. Also, like for example, when I'm in Bombay, I meet people from all over the country, uh, people from different backgrounds, uh, different mindsets, different approaches, and you learn because of your creativity and because of the other person might be thinking. So it creates a whole lot of empathy. 
uh, and also being an artist is a solitary thing. You can't create music when you hang out with a lot of people. You do that when you get time. But you, if you want to be a musician, you got to spend a whole lot of time playing to yourself, playing the guitar, or you're singing your songs or writing lyrics. And the first draft is not the song that you're going to be using in your album. Probably it'll be the hundred draft, you know. And even then, you'll be doubtful whether it's nice and whether people will like it, or just like making movies, actually. So it creates a whole lot of atmosphere in your head, which teaches you patience, empathy. It, it teaches you how to be happy with yourself in solitude, you know. So even for a writer, you know, if you want to write a book, you've got to spend a whole lot of time alone with yourself. So I think creativity uh, helps with a whole lot of those things, which are finally uh, helpful if you, if you become a leader in any field, you know. And you could be a leader in, in leader doesn't mean politician, you know. You could be a leading person in your, in your artistic pursuit or, or science or literature or, you know, whatever you want to do. So I think creativity, if you really, really exercise your creative processes and enjoy them, then it uh, helps you with all these beautiful things like patience, empathy, uh, yourself, you can understand. So I think that really is important. Yeah. I hope it's all for you. I'm going to add to that actually. As a comedian, I can also chip in on that. Right. Is that uh, one, uh, creativity helps you with lateral thinking. And lateral thinking allows you to look at problems uh, through a different way. Absolutely. Uh, secondly, there's leadership by example. I mean, there's a reason that Mohit is in this room because you have seen the journey he has taken, and and the field teaches you is relationship skills. Today, as, as artists, people will work with us because they want to work with us. How do you build those relationships? How do you how do you work on those networks? And a very important thing that Mohit said also about how when you first sing the song. Oh, how you form a band? Yeah. Electric guitar has got nothing to do with that. Okay? Uh, for a band, you need people. And uh, you can play electric or acoustic. You can play ukulele or mandolin. doesn't really matter. Okay, you know, this is something that I've thought about many, many times, you know. Uh, how does bands come into existence? Because my existence today uh, is based on a band that I formed uh, with two other guys. And uh, after a whole lot of brain smashing, you know, we found this name called Silk Root. And uh, our manager, Dev Steinpe, uh, Param. So he was a senior guy. And uh, so he would sit down with us with like 25 names, different, different names, names of flowers and trees and animals and uh, mythical names. And it became really difficult to choose a name. So. Name you can still choose, but your band members, uh, you need to find, you need to feel that little chemistry when you meet another musician and you get time to sit down and play some music and spend time, you know, it doesn't need to be a formal thing. There has to be a certain camaraderie, you know, a certain kind of ease that you feel with another musician and you end up playing music by the end of the evening and you're chilling out, having a good time. And if you start feeling that there's a certain nice thing with this guy, you know, you're playing the guitar, maybe he's playing the flute, or maybe he's playing another, another guitar, or maybe he's just singing harmonies with you, you know. So that feeling needs to come in. Bands, successful bands can't be forced. You know, um, there have been examples of that where MTV and other channels have put together bands um, like Spice Girls. There was one band. Um, even in Korea, they do that, you know, they select artists. Then they groom them for like two years. They make them do karate, kung fu, yoga, and singing and dancing. Then they make an act out of that. And that's a different thing. But if you want, want something organic, then you need to find, not find, I wouldn't say, because it's difficult to find, you know. How do you find people? So it just happens. But when it happens, you need to recognize it and hold on to it. And that's when your other skills will come into play, you know, where you can relate to the other person. Like he was talking about you. You uh, positive, you know, you are positive in that place over there. Uh, you're adding something to his music. He's adding or she's adding something to your music. So I think becoming a band is a very organic thing. It just happens. Uh, a lot of bands also break, you know, across the world. There are many, many examples. But some of the bands uh, have stayed, you know, like uh, the bands like Rolling Stones and 
uh, you two, you know, who, who are still playing music, they're like 70 years old. And just because of that, my respect for Rolling Stones, uh, I went to see them, you know, play live uh, across the world, you know, I traveled especially to do that. Because they met in 60s, late 60s, they were 17, 16, 17 years old. And even today, they're playing music, they're like 73, 74 years old, all wrinkled up, but they still play their music amazingly and happily and with the same gusto. So I think forming a band is an organic thing, you know. But when it's happening, just be aware that you met good people. Don't get into ego and don't get into that stuff, you know. Be cool. And if you're getting something beautiful out of it, then you also have to give something back to them. So hang out and then keep playing your electric guitar and sing and whatever you want to do. I wish you all the best for that. I just have one follow-up question. Um, where did you get your first gigs? Like uh, See, gigs is about uh, some people in the world getting to know that you play music. And if you, they think you're good at a certain genre of music, then there'll be some opportunity somewhere where probably there be, won't be any money. And because you're not known, nobody knows what you do. So somebody will ask you to come play somewhere. And that's how it starts. And one thing leads to another. But you got to be at it. So I wanted to ask you. Finally. <laughs> no, this wasn't even I'm going to put my hand up. He's like, I've just got the microphone. <laughs> so what's he going to do? <laughs> um, so I wanted to ask you, there has been a recent shift in popular culture music. And uh, we've moved from meaningful, organic, uh, you know, soulful songs to cosmetic and vulgar songs. And to, there's a whole item industry out there. So how is it, you know, to exist as a music? A very privatized, very, what do you call it? Uh, commercial, commercial and populist yeah. thing. I want to ask you about that. Uh, well, yes, it has become commercial, but that's the movie business. You know, a lot of music that you hear on the radio, uh, I really get, you know, irritated by that. That at 7 in the morning, the kind of music that you hear on the radio, yeah. the same song you'll hear at 6 o'clock in the evening also. So, uh, but that's all business, you know. There are big music labels who uh, have a whole lot of money. They want a certain kind of music because of their own taste in music, you know. Like if I'm if I'm a really rich guy and I can sponsor so many musicians, I'll say, oh, make this kind of music for me and I'll pay you. So as an artist, I know many artists who would rather play something else or make different kind of songs. But because it's a film ruled by the finances of the film, so everybody is thinking first about the money and the art comes piche papers. I think it's what we spoke about earlier as well. As an artist, there are some things you have to do to feed the stomach and some things you have to do to feed the soul. Some of it is fine, but then um, as an artist, uh, it's much easier to express yourself now because of the internet, you know. And I always stress that uh, whichever field you are in, please focus on originality. You know, we've had like great singers and films and everything and I appreciate that. And you listen to that music and you learn from it. But finally, as an artist, what are you contributing to the world of art? So I think that's really, really important, whether, whether you do theatre or films or, you know, anything that you want to do. It's like, it's like that line from Dead Poets Society, where Robert Williams says, what will your verse be? Yeah. So, Somebody, anyone here have a question? Yeah, go on. Don't worry, just shout. Hey, sir. Uh, so your sister is married to an army officer. You recently performed at the Kargil Vijay Divas. What influence has the relation with the forces had on you? Okay. Uh, so I, uh, like I was telling you, I, I uh, grew up, you know, in Himachal Pradesh, and I grew up among a whole lot of mountains and rivers, and I love the outdoors. So at one point of time, when I finished my masters, uh, because I had done my masters in geology. A lot of my friends from my department were joining ONGC and other places. And uh, that was an option for me. Another option was joining the army. Because uh, I had friends in the army and uh, they would say, Oh, you love the outdoors. And, you know, it'd be great if you join the army and you love that kind of life. So, you know, there was a little interest uh, in the army, but that didn't happen. Uh, my mom would say, you know, you wake up so late in the morning, how, how will you join the army? <laughs> you know, sleeping at 12 in the night and waking up. Anyway, that was, uh, but that was true. So later on, I thought maybe I, it didn't happen. You know, kind of thing. But then, um, 
I've been a musician for so many years now. So I had a bit of a dream you know, to uh, contribute to the armed forces. So uh, last to last year, I went and did seven concerts for the army at the front post, you know, that they have, the border post that they have. And uh, we took permission from the army uh, to perform and they said, uh, so we chose Sikkim, you know, as one place. And Sikkim has a huge border, uh, China. So uh, I did three concerts uh, for the army and three for the SSB. And they wanted me to come and perform in Kalimpong and Darjeeling. So we said, no, we just only want to go to the uh, border post. So uh, in Sikkim for the army, I went to a place called Shirithang, which is near Nathula. And I performed there for the army Jawans. And it's at, at about 14,000 feet. Then I went to a place called uh, Kupuk, which is 16,500 feet. And uh, I performed there for the Jawans. And then I went to a place called Satara Mil, you know, and that's where they had the Kargil unit, the Pofors. And uh, then I went to West Sikkim to perform for the SSB. So what I did was, in fact, I spent my own money to do this, out of my own passion to be able to hang out with the Fauji guys over there. I did not take my band from Bombay. I told these guys that I'll perform with your band. So I uh, practiced and rehearsed with the army band. So they were playing all my songs, Sada Haq and Pilu and Tumsei. Then I rehearsed with the SSB band. And they were all soldiers, you know, in soldier uniforms. And I uh, did full performances of these. And then there was a final concert, the seventh concert, which I did uh, in Gangtok. And that was for the whole fraternity. So there was SSB, Army, IDBP, everyone was there. So that's my connection and that's where it sort of came about, you know, to, so I could do something for the Army. and I, and the interesting part is that this was supposed to happen July, June, July. But because of delays and delays, this happened in December. So you can imagine 16,000 feet in December. Uh, <laughs> but I had a great time. You know. So my connection with the army is from the heart, you know. But as a musician, I, I, I'll keep doing whatever I can. Yeah. Wonderful. We'll, we'll come back to you in a few minutes for sure. Let's we'll start with the guys at the back, yeah. Sir, my name is Sanjeev uh, uh, uh So I've been a big fan of yours, and one of my favorite albums of yours was Rockstar. And one of my favorite scenes in the movie was uh, when Jordan's mentor Katana Mai sits next to him, and he tells him that there is nobody who's ever been a successful musician without having his heart broken. So somebody who's a very successful musician amongst us here today, what was your heart broken? <laughs> <laughs> what a question. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I was talking about my first album, uh, Silk Root, which was album. Tha. So there was this song that was released, the first, called Duba Duba. And the song was Duba Duba, Reta Maakha, Me Tiri Tiri Din Din Ni Karte, Deo Fa Aja Deo Fa. So... Uh, Don't worry, before we finish, you will be asked to sing this song. <laughs> what right so, many people have, you know, sort of, are curious to know who I wrote this song for and you know how how come this song has Bay of Fire and you know who went away and <laughs> who broke their heart. But uh, strangely, you know, nothing like that happened. And uh, I think if you if you immerse especially in music, you know, music is the finest of all the fine arts, you know. It has a straight connection with the soul. Uh, a good song can make you dance, cry, make you make you Nostalgic, make you go back in memories. So I think if if uh, if you really immerse yourself in the creative process and if you really feel for the song that you're doing and you're making it, uh, I think there's a certain ache in the heart that an artist will feel at a certain point of time. You know, it's like you're doing a concert and six people are playing on the stage and you all have rehearsed and everything and you know the lyrics. Everybody's grooving and some place in the concert there'll be a place where you will transcend, you know. For five seconds, you know, you'll feel you're in heaven, it's amazing. And then it comes back, you know, and then, so that kind of a feeling produces a little ache in the heart. That ache, that pain is for something that, you know, it's beyond words, you know, it's something emotional, it could be a, 
primordial thing. You know, it could be a longing from the past, from your previous birth, uh, ache of like I feel compassion when I see dogs. You know, animals. You know, I really feel for them, and there's a little pain that I feel. I wish I could do more for them. So I think that kind of pain is important sometimes. You know, when you're writing a song, when you're creating something. So there was no love affair. It was just, <laughs> it was just an ache. So you. <laughs> you know, I'd like to know where the ache is. <laughs> I don't think you want to know where that ache is. <laughs> you know, when it comes to alcohol, with bottles, they pawa half and whole. Kishore Kumar used to say, char chot or ek hole. Tab awaz me so rata hai. Yes, madam, we cannot stop you. So why don't you ask your question and then we'll go back. We'll go to the lady in the back there. Ah, microphone, yeah, so everyone else can hear it. As you write songs, so how do you deal with a writer's block? You know, at times when you just don't feel like writing. You want to write, but you can't find the right words to put it in. So how do you deal with that? See, if you don't have any deadlines, if you have time on your side, yeah. then you just gotta let it go. You try and try and try, and sometimes you just stop doing it, and you do something else. And if you put at the back of your head, it's still there, and it's churning you. And sometimes certain words just come out like that. So many times when you when you're writing a song, uh, the initial part comes a little fast, you know. Like an inspiration comes really fast and you get a hook, nice thing, but you think, oh now I've got to take the song forward, you know, I, I need to make one antra or say antra, what the interlude is gonna be. That's when the real hard work starts. Because then if you are writing a song and if you are arranging it, putting it together, then it's your decision. If there's gonna be a sitar in the song, do you think there should be a guitar in the song? Do you think there should be electric guitar or a flute in the song? It's hard work. You know? <laughs> Deciding what exactly. And that's where I think your instinct comes in, you know. So I think even when you're writing lyrics, your instinct should be allowed to take the lead, actually. The very good point about deadlines and commercial obligations. Because the other upside of being an artist is if you don't feel like writing, you don't write. <laughs> and also, like, you know, I started off doing a lot of jingles before I made the band to make a living in Delhi. I met a friend of mine and he was part of this advertising agency, a big advertising agency. So we were chilling out one evening and I said, I'm looking for a job, man, give me a job. So he said, I've heard a jam that you did in the hills with another friend of ours, who's a mutual friend. And he said, I heard that jam and it sounded really nice, why don't you make music? So I said, but who's gonna give me work? Because I had never seen the inside of a studio ever in my life. I didn't know what I'll do if I go inside. So he got me my first job. So when you're doing advertising, that's what you learn. You know, you write some lyrics, which to you are sounding really shitty. And the client is sitting across the table and he says, wow, lovely lyrics. <laughs> you stop right there. A bro, very nice, very nice. Cool, cool, let's do it, let's do it, finish. It's done, you know. You take your check, go back home. But when it's your song, then you want to say something which, you know, will come in time or it take two days, it can take three months. Like I have some unfinished songs for like three years, four years. You know. Half a song then it's been relegated to the archive. <laughs> and then you keep working and one day you'll just pick that song up and put something on it. Like they say with client work, the first draft you write for yourself. After that, nanda. <laughs> there, was a girl, uh, there was a girl right at the back who had a question. Go on. Good evening, sir. Uh, my name is Muskan, and my question to you is that if you could describe your life in three Bollywood movie titles, what would those be? I can tell you one. I can tell you one title for him for sure, which is Rock On. Sir. Rock on. I said rock on. That's not my song, but no, it's not about any movie. It says if you could describe your life, life by movie titles. Does the, oh. does the movie Rock On reflect your yeah, life? Yeah, it does. Not. <laughs> I'm still rocking on. <laughs> but there's one song that describes my situation, you know, mostly in life. Jo bhi main kehna chahu, barbaad kare alfaaz. Okay, go on. Okay, one second. This, she's been waiting for some time. So let's get a microphone. Don't worry, there are time I got. So recent question was uh, addressed to the issue that how music has undergone a change in its form since the last 50 to 60 years. 
So 60 years back, a singer, for example, if a singer was singing or recording a song, uh, if you if you messed even a single lyric of the last line, you had to record the song all over again. However, nowadays, if you want to uh, say, if you mess up even a single word, you can just record that single word again. What my question is that, do you think that such generalizability has somewhere led to the loss of gravity that musicians today and then had in the, in the process? Gravity that musicians today and then had in the, in the process. Do you think that uh, has that happened to you? Uh, that's true because, uh, you know, early years, 60s, 70s, uh, there were no computers. There were about, you know, 8 track recording or maybe later on it turned 16 track. Now you can have 120 tracks, you know. So, that was one difference. But still, uh, you could splice the tape and do the last line, you know. Uh, you could do the whole song, if something goes wrong, you don't have to sing the whole song. But you can splice the tape and correct it and join it together. But the most important thing which I feel was that part of time because there was no computers, all the music that was uh, being recorded was recorded live. So if there's a string section, a string sound, there's a star sound, there's a guitar sound, there's a harmonica, there's a flute, there's a clarinet, uh, it was all live. There were live musicians, uh, people who really knew what they were doing, sitting, writing the track and playing along. In today's world, there are many, many songs that you hear on the radio where not even a single inch of the song has been recorded live. So the guitar that you hear is from a computer, from a synth, because there are patches, I mean, the string sounds from... That's also, I think, because a lot of music sounds the same. You know, I, I as an artist, feel that that's not a good thing, you know. Everything sounds the same because you as a musician, we use the same passes. I also use the same programs, you know, they're available in the market. So you go to the market on Amazon, you buy, I need that drum program. So you'll get hundred different drum sounds, which will be exactly similar to the sounds that I have. Okay. But after that, there's no human touch. So you're putting the drums on a keyboard. And I'm also doing the same thing, but it's digital. So it doesn't have any human touch. So they're not dynamics. Dynamics have been lost in music in the recent times because everything is electronic. I think that's a huge, huge uh, differentiator in music. Like if you listen to Ardi Burman songs from the old times, uh, the dynamics, the bass in the song, everything. And he also uh, used to use a lot of folk instruments. So you'll hear, you know, all the sounds and the bells, they're all folk instruments that they were using. Today, those sounds have been lost in the heads of many, many musicians. Because the focus is on getting the film producer to approve the song and get it done with, you know. So the artistic angle has become a little sort of, uh, it's ignored for a little while, you know. In, in the rush to make a song and complete the film song and if the uh, film director or the finance or other people approve, uh, then it's done and the song is done. So there's a bit of that difference actually. It creates a huge difference in the sound and as you hear it. You'll find in a lot of artistic professions now people are in a hurry to learn the tricks of the trade before they learn the trade. So yeah, that's true. Good, up, good yeah. afternoon, sir. My name is Rishabh. Uh, so one of your most beautiful songs is Abhi Kuch Dinose from Dil To Bacha Hai Ji. So sir, can you please sing that for us? Uh, so please, sir. Please, sir. Okay, you want you sing. What you sing? I want to sing a dance by a mask. <laughs> so, so should, we, should we save the musical request till the uh, end? I'll sing right. one, two lines in the end. You'll sing two lines at the end. We'll look at the many, many songs. I can't sing all the songs. Please, but this one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, go ahead. Hi, sir. I'm Pranav. And my question to you is, since we were talking about technology right now, so which technology also comes auto-tune? So my question is that um, nowadays autotune is being used and people who can't sing really, really well also sound extremely nice as a playback voice. And there are certain people who actually genuinely sing really well who aren't recognized and even if they are recognized, they don't get the amount of fame that, that the autotuned singers get. So um, do you feel that that is an upcoming problem, which I mean it is, but uh, what do you think could be done to, to solve that? Can you share what auto-tune is for the people who don't know? 
Have you went once? <laughs> For me. <laughs> uh, see, Autotune is like any other program that you have on the musical apparatus that you have, you know, in, in the studios. Apart from the reverb, the delays, and the first distortions, and the EQs, you know, you have a program called Autotune. So if, for example, you're singing in a key of G, and uh, I set the auto-tune to G, uh, everything in that song will fall into the slots of that particular key. But if you're not a good singer, and you're not being able to hold the tune right, uh, if I put an auto-tune, G on it, it'll also distort it. So auto-tune is just one program which people uh, use uh, to set certain things right in the manufacturing of the song. So basically, uh, in studio, it's not performance, you know. It's the manufacture of the song. So a song can take two days, three days, you can record five lines and rethink them, and record them again. So auto-tune is one such program. And people uh, who sound good without auto-tune uh, will sound good without auto-tune. And people who sound average with auto tune, they'll sound average anyways, you know. So a good singer, a good artist will always break through. But my focus is always on originality, you know. You make something of your own. And if you're good at it, you'll break through. Auto tune or no auto tune. You know. But I personally prefer no auto tune. Because uh, voice has natural uh, ups and downs and highs and lows, like you showed myself. Now, if you put Kishore Kumar's song on an auto-tune, everything will become too damn perfect, you know. And it will become so perfect that it won't, sign, uh, won't sound nice at all. You can imagine that, you know, there's a difference of like... But because of his human uh, things that he's doing, uh, it sounds much better without auto-tune. So I think uh, it's not that really an important thing, you know. Uh, I know some people who can't sing, use some auto tune and but then those guys you know splice the songs uh distort it put it together it's not meant to be a song actually it's just meant to be an item you know in some film, actually so it's not the kind of song that you carry in your car and listen to when you go on a drive thank you uh the girl just behind you just pass the pass the microphone to the girl behind you we will come to you next and then we go there good evening sir my name is Hector. I'm a classical dancer and I've been practicing since six years now. So what, one thing which I have noticed um, among the years of my training, when the first year I performed in, for the first time on stage, I had seen an auditorium which was full of people. But now over the years, I only see parents of the children who are performing. They are very, and they, there is very less audience to watch a classical program. Not only the ones in which I perform, but I also go to view uh, performances by great artists. But then again, there is very less audience. So is it the same with all the artistical fields? Like, there is much more less interest left to for the classical art as in the, the fusion arts or more arts. Uh, I think there's always been a difference between the popular, uh, you know, uh, artistic fields and the more sort of classical fields. And for classical, uh, music and dance audiences will be a little niche, you know, because many people might not have the patience to sit and watch an elaborate classical dance or, or, or song, you know, classical rag, for example, because uh, that's a completely different line, you know. Uh, somebody who listens to rock music might have interest in classical music, but might not have any interest and no patience to sit for two hours and listen to uh, slowly, slowly, beautiful rock rising up and reaching a crescendo, it takes a long time. Uh, pop music takes about three minutes, you know, maybe two and a half minutes, sometimes a minute and a half to reach a crescendo. So it's a completely different audience. And uh, I personally feel uh, classical music and folk music uh, needs to be pampered and promoted by the authorities, by the government, uh, by the people who, uh, you know, run the culture, uh, departments of the country. Uh, it's very important to have our classical singers and dancers, especially the folk people, uh, to be supported, you know, so that their art uh, remains and is not lost, you know, after time, sometime. The problem also is we live in a world of limited attention spans. Today with mobile phones, 
a Facebook video counts it as a view if somebody sees it for three seconds, right? But for authentic art forms, it's like T20 cricket and test match. The guys who love test matches will still watch test matches, but maybe what feels like yours need is better marketing to try and get more people in. But once again, you would rather be playing for or performing for 50 people who really appreciate what you do than 500 people where half of them are on their phones. For example, for music, uh, somebody said that the worst thing that happened to music was the music video. Because it took away from people the ability to imagine and listen to the song and relate the song to yourself. So that's why when you're driving in the rain and there's beautiful mountains and uh, you listen to the song on the radio or your playlist, it sounds much, much closer to you. Because when you try to watch a video, your attention from the song is gone for like half a second. And you forget the connection, you know, how did the song come up here? What happened in the interview? You forget and you're looking at that woman or guy walking in the video and you know, if it's a nice video, a bad video, whatever, whatever. So, it's exactly like that. So I think when, when you guys, are, you know, grow up and you go out, go out and start your lives and everything, don't run after that instant thing, you know. Yeah, there's nothing instant in life and uh, whatever you get an instant also becomes boring in an instant, you know. So be content and whatever you want to do, just follow it nicely, happily and be chill out, be cool, you know. The world still has a lot of time, you know. And just do your stuff, Alam said, that's what I want to say. Also what happens with the music video, for example, is an interpretation of the song is forced upon you. Whereas with art, you should have the freedom to interpret it and feel it the way you want to feel it. Uh, anyway, on to you. Can we get her a microphone? I think I want to. Oh, yeah, go for it. Uh, good evening, sir. My name is Divanshi. Mm -hmm. My question to you is, sir, that uh, we see a rapid growth in hip-hop culture in India, or the rap culture, as you may call it. Uh, so, sir, I want to ask, uh, what is your favorite rap song? And keeping commercial raps aside, what is, uh, which is your favorite rap star in India, as of now? Uh, rap as a genre uh, has never really sort of... Uh, come close to my heart, you know. Uh, I appreciate it and uh, I've heard some rap, Indian as well as Western. And uh, see, I, my thing is that, for example, if you listen to Eminem, you know, he's a big rap star in the world. Um, he is writing a song which is not uh, dictated by the love story in a movie. Okay, or the story somebody's written and somebody's trying to sell a film to you. So they want to make a song which is flashy and uh, I have a problem with that. Over here in India, there, there are a lot of rap guys, you know, there are a lot of people doing rap and stuff. This is cool. But the rap that you hear most are the rap songs in the films. And my problem is those rap songs are based on the uh, somebody else's story and how that girl is so cool and she's going to party. And it's part of a film, you know. So that doesn't take me deeper, you know, into into uh, what exactly the singer or, or the writer wants to say. Like you love songs with meaningful lyrics, okay? So even a rap song, if it's meaningful, then probably it'll touch you more. But if it's only about being cool, and so maybe one song is cool, but you can't have too many songs on the same theme, you know. So uh, that's what sort of, uh, that's something that I, I find difficult to sort of relate to. but. As an, as an art form, uh, rap in its own right is, is a recognized rap form, you know, and uh, some people do it very, very coolly, you know, very, very nicely. You didn't relate to that deep, meaningful song? That one with my. What is Dhuk Machalo with the Bulk of Chen? Both classical. I'll never go to the To the girl at the back. Let's go to the girl at the back. Oh, sorry. On the order. No, 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 no. Office, 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 office. Yeah, then you go for it, and we go to the other back. So you spoke about how uh, folks... Listen, there's no point having a microphone in your hand and then shouting. You might as well use it. <laughs> so, uh, so you spoke about how folk music needs to be pampered and... Uh, so, so my question to you is, uh, basically in this age of commercialization, so how do you think that folk music can be given its uh, due importance? As uh, Since, as you mentioned correctly, that people do not have the exact uh, time uh, to 
See, like, uh, uh, you know, we, uh, me with my wife and, you know, uh, whole team, uh, we also do a storytelling festival uh, called Kathakar, which happened, uh, you know, a few days back uh, at the Hama Yushto. Now, storytelling as an art uh, form has come about in the recent times. But storytelling was something that you would experience in your house. Your grandmother would tell you a story. Uh, you know, there are many, many mythological figures that I know about. But I know about them because my family or my grandma or somebody would tell me a story when I was a little small kid. So that art form is being lost, you know, because of the uh, speed of living now, the fast pace. So we organize a festival called the Kathaka where we get storytellers from across the world and it's a performing storytelling. So you don't read from a book. You stand on the stage and you perform a story. And uh, I've seen um, uh, storytellers from Poland, from the UK, from America, from Africa, and they tell their own story. There was one English lady who told the story of Kali and performed it you know, on the stage. That's also as an art form, you know, it's, it's disappearing, so we thought we should push it. Same way, folk music, you know, we have great amounts of folk music in our country. And uh, so I think it's, it's important that Sakari, the government institutions, and the musicians come up on a bigger stage, uh, give them a better platform, uh, give them more exposure. I would love to listen to folk music of many, many different states, you know, which I don't really get to hear. Like sometimes when I'm at the airport, many times I also hear my own songs in the airport. But sometimes inside my heart I feel they should have been playing some folk music over here, you know. Himachaka folk music abhi bajra hota, Urisa ka bajra hota, North East ka bajra hota. So it gives people an opportunity to experience the the music of the soil actually, you know. Instead of, kiyo wo film music sun rahe, wohi gaana the radio mein bhi sun rahe, wohi suha bhi sun rahe, wohi shaam ko bhi sun rahe, TV mein bhi wohi aata hai. So it, uh, us tegi se, I think more avenues can be sort of uh, made for folk musicians for these kind of arts so that they are more visible. And when they're more visible, then they become more uh, lucrative also, you know, and then people ask to perform, travel. So it kind of creates a ripple effect. One, storytelling is a crucial skill no matter what you do now. Yes, absolutely. In your experience, what are the elements that go into a good story? How can you be a good storyteller? I think a good story uh, is something that, uh, firstly, you need to be able to express what you are what you have in your mind, uh, which is basically a sequence of events that you're talking about. So like a good storytelling would be your cousin maybe who comes home and tells you a story about Raj College mein kya hua Raj College mein panga ho gaya, ye ho gaya, wo ho gaya, wo badal aare thai, bhaag ke wahan se aaya, panga ho aaya, usko na utar gaya. That's like a story, you know. So a story could be a mythological story, it could be a recent story, it could be a story of a war. I think a good story is basically three things. Uh, a good beginning, a middle, and a good end. They like Azharuddin asks, what is your strategy for the match? He said, I'm going to bat well, field well, and ball well. That is actually a good story. And then your capability to be able to express it and uh, uh, relate to your audience. How do you do that? So that depends on your personal, that's how you do that. Is it your voice? Is it, is it your movement? Is it your posture, you know, how do you do that? You know? So, I mean, many people think storytelling is kind of they can, when you watch the real storytellers, it's about how you tell it. It's amazing. And people use a whole lot of props and instruments and, you know, things on stage also, but it could be just one man sitting under a tree and telling you a story. Okay, one last question. You've already had a question. You've already had a question. Somebody who hasn't asked, uh, uh, go ahead. And like, or, like, do you need to have connections with people who are already um, big in the industry? And did you have a connection with someone um, when you first entered? Well, I, I was in Delhi when I, I formed the band uh, with two other guys called Silk Root. And uh, so we met somebody through someone who said, I'll help you guys, I'll become your manager. So you signed a contract with me. So, uh, but the most important thing to get work is, first of all, you need to have something in your hand.
to show somebody. Like if you're a singer, okay, this is this is what I've done, you know, listen to my song. I think that's the most important thing. I started getting work in the films after people had heard my uh, my own songs, you know, in the albums that I released. So I think first you need to have the material and after that you need to uh, go out and uh, show the concerned people your material, what you have. And if you show it to 10 people, 12 people, 13, 15 people, one of them will probably find it nice, you know, and uh, that's how it sort of goes ahead. Basically it's show business. Half of it is the show, the other half is business, but the show needs to come first. Right, I think we're towards the end and it's now time to honor a special request, sir. If you won't mind obliging. Sing a couple of lines of whatever song makes you happy or that gentleman there who's desperate, desperate for you to sing one particular song. Okay, I'll sing it stage. Stage is yours. You guys know that song? You guys know Tumse? 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 Some of you can stand. 